From the time we disobey until we repent, we lose the joy of salvation. Now we know why when David sinned against God, in Psalm 51 verse 12 he says, Restore to me the joy of salvation. Restore to me. I lost my joy of salvation. I have not lost salvation. The joy of salvation. Restore to me. And when we repent today and call upon the name of Jesus, we are restored to fellowship with God and we get back this amazing joy of salvation. So peace and joy are gifts given to us and we preserve this peace and joy through obedience. And this is why, I believe this is why God wants us to obey him. Not because if we don't obey, he's going to send us to hell. No. He's a selfless God. When God tells us to do something, it's for our benefit, not for his benefit. He's a selfless God. He wants us to obey him for our good. In the Old Testament time, we read in the book of Job, chapter 35, 6 to 8, we read, Job 35, 6 to 8. If you sin, how does it affect him? If your sins are many, what does that do to him? If you are righteous, what do you give to him? What do you receive from your hand? Your wickedness only affects a man like yourself. Righteousness only the sons of men. So peace and joy are conditional to sustained obedience. Sustained intimacy with God is only possible with sustained obedience and constantly pleasing God, for which he gives us faith and he strengthens us. Today we are in God's kingdom. So as we obey him, we can enjoy peace and joy, which is God's kingdom. And to be able to obey him, as I shared on, on, on Thursday, on Saturday actually, uh, yesterday, the, uh, the ninth point I shared was strength, power. First Corinthians 4.20 says, talking about kingdom of God again, First Corinthians 4.20, for the kingdom of God is not a matter of talk, but of power. He empowers us to be able to obey him. And as we obey him, we preserve the peace and joy of the Lord. So the Lord tells us to obey him after receiving salvation. It's not to get salvation, but to work out our salvation, working out our peace, working out our joy, that people around us can see those things. People are searching for peace, will see peace in us. Who's searching for joy, will see joy in us. And it become a tremendous opportunity for us to share the gospel. So, tenth amazing blessing of living by the word is manifesting and preserving the peace and the joy of the Lord. Number 11. Number 11 is confidence in our prayers. Now, all of us pray. Every Christian prays. But how many Christians are not sure of the prayer being heard? Confidence of prayer being answered. So to be able to have confidence in our prayers, it's imperative that we pray according to God's word. Knowing God's word, living by God's word, and as you understand the word of God, how prayers are heard by God and answered by God, as we obey scriptures, we'll have confidence of our prayers being heard and being answered. We look at John 15, 7. Jesus says, John 15, 7, If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish, it will be done for you. If you remain in me and my words remain in you. Which means... For us to have confidence that he's heard our prayer, he'll answer our prayer, that confidence will come when we pray according to scriptures and also obey scriptures. What's the meaning of if you remain in me? If you remain in me? How do you remain in him? How many times they find the Bible, the term, in Christ, in him, abide in him? What does it practically mean to abide in him? 
1 John 3.24 says, Those who obey his commandments live in him and he in them. And this is how we know he lives in us. We know it by the spirit he gave us. We live in him through obedience. He lives in us through his spirit. So as we obey him, and as we know the scriptures, we will find that our prayers are according to scriptures. And we know God's scriptures reveal the will of God. And if you look at 1 John chapter 5, 14, 15, we read. 1 John chapter 5, verse 14, 15. This is a confidence we have in approaching God. Then we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. When you ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if you know he hears us, we know we receive what you asked of him. So for our prayers to be effective, for us to have confidence in what we pray, number one, we should pray according to God's word, obey God's word, God's word reveals God's will. And second condition for having confidence of our prayers is asking according to God's will, which again is revealed in scripture. So all these verses in the Bible, which I'm going to share now, I shared before also many times, they talk about hindrances in our prayers. When you remove the hindrances in prayer, we'll have confidence of our prayers being heard and we thank him for hearing our prayer and we'll patiently wait for him to answer our prayers. So number one, should know the scriptures, to pray according to scriptures. Number two, scriptures reveal God's will. When you ask according to God's will, he hears us. So lack of knowing God's word is a hindrance. Lack of knowing God's will is a hindrance. Both are removed as you live by the word. Number three, when you ask by faith, God answers. In 21st chapter of Matthew, verse 22, it is written, the Lord says, Whatever I ask for in prayer, believe receive it, be yours. You have to ask by faith. And even faith comes from the word. As you keep on hearing God's word, our faith increases. We grow in faith. So lack of faith is a hindrance in prayer. And faith is removed by living according to God's word, asking for more and more faith. Number four, bitterness. Bitterness hinders grace. 11th chapter of uh, Mark, verse 24 and 25, the Lord says to the people, whatever you ask for in prayer, believe receive it and be yours. It will be yours. And when you stand praying, you remember you hold anything against anybody, forgive him that the Father will forgive you. So we have to put away Every bitterness in our hearts. Otherwise, it hinder our prayers. Number five, cherishing sin. When you cherish sin in your heart, God will not listen. Psalm 66 verse 18 says, the psalmist says, if I cherish sin in my heart, God will not listen. If I regard iniquity in my heart, God will not listen. And obviously, when you live by the Bible, you don't cherish sin. We sin now and then, no doubt about it. But he won't cherish it. What's the meaning of cherishing sin? Cherishing sin is a latent desire to continue in sin for some time. Cherishing it. Wanting to have it. When you live by the Bible, live by the Holy Spirit, then the cherishing sin will not happen. We do sin sin sometimes. We don't depend upon God for his strength. We end up doing something wrong. And the Holy Spirit will convict us. He will empower us to come out of it. And we are back to fellowship with God. Cherishing sin hinders, uh, hinders our prayers. Psalm 66 verse 18. And one more hindrance, sixth hindrance, is wrong motivation in asking God. In James chapter 4 verse 3 we read, You ask and don't receive because you ask the wrong motives. And the word of God tells us about how that what we ask God may be right, but may have wrong motivation. 
It says in Proverbs chapter 16, verse 2, Proverbs 16, 2, all a man's ways seem right to him, but motives are weighed by the Lord. You know, you ask God for something good, like you ask God for spiritual gifts, you ask him for gifts of healing, you ask him for miraculous powers, it's good. Good desire spiritual gifts. But what's the motivation? Motivation could be to be become very popular. So one has gifts of healing, the whole town will be at your door. You have a gift of working miracles, people come flocking to you and you get puffed up. So motivation to ask for spiritual gift also could be wrong. Nothing wrong asking God for spiritual gifts. Please ask that the Lord may be glorified through your exercising of the gifts and people edified. It's not about us. It's not about our popularity or our image before people. To glorify God and edify his people. So these six hindrances revealed in the scripture, when you put away, we'll have confidence in our prayers. Then also we read about the Lord Jesus Christ's prayers in the book of Hebrews, chapter 5, verse 7. It says about Jesus, Hebrews 5, 7. During the days of Jesus Christ on earth, during the days of his life on this earth, he offered up prayers and petitions with loud cries and tears to the one who could save him from death. And he was heard because of his reverent submission. Reverent submission. He reverently submitted to the will of the Father. He reverently obeyed everything the Lord told him to do. While we obey God, question is, are we reverently obeying or are we mournfully obeying or are we complaining and obeying? Is obedience a burden for us or a joy for us? The reverent is submit to the will of God, we will know our prayers are heard. Remember the time the Lord was uh, at Lazarus' tomb and he prayed a prayer to the Father in heaven? Two sentences. John 11, 41, 42 to the Father and verse 43, one sentence to Lazarus. To the Father he said, I thank you, Father, you heard me I knew you always hear me, but I say this for Ben, those standing here, they may believe you sent me. That's all. I knew you always hear me. Thank you, you hear me. He's thanking the Father for hearing him. Full confidence because he reverently submitted the will of the Father. When we pray, do we thank him for hearing our prayer? He always hears our prayers. Do we thank him? Or are we doubting? After praying, I'll tell the whole world, you also pray, you also pray, you also pray. Whenever you prayed for something, you know God has heard your prayer. You keep on telling everyone to be, you also pray, you also pray. What it actually mean? it means, you're not confident God has heard your prayer. If he's heard your prayer, will answer. So why do you want everyone to pray? Certain things that concern the whole church, of course, all of us pray. Church unity, gospel sharing, for the country to be saved, all of us pray. Together we pray, no doubt about it. But some prayers, personal prayers, between us and God, each one of us, when you pray rightly before God, with the, removing all the hindrance I told you about, you know he's heard. Why make everyone else pray for them? Thank him for hearing. The moment you pray, you thank him for hearing that prayer. He will answer in his time. Until that time, what do we do? Since we have confidence in our prayers, we thank Him for hearing our prayer and we get busy doing what God wants us to do. Isaiah 26 verse 8. Isaiah 26 8. Walking in the way of your law, we wait for you. Your name and renown are the desire of our hearts. While waiting for God to answer our prayers, in his time, we'll answer our prayers. He's heard it. Very first time we pray, he's heard already. He'll answer in his time, in his way. In the meantime, we shouldn't be obsessed about lack of answer to our prayer. 
Rather, thank him for hearing our prayer. In his time, he will answer. In his way, he will answer. Leave it to him. He knows best how to answer our prayers. That happens when we are right with God. When you pray according to God's word and live God's word. You should know scriptures to be able to pray effectively. When Daniel was in, uh, in exile in Babylon, he had known from the book of Jeremiah that 70 years be exiled in Babylon, 70 years will be exiled, God told them before they went. Ninth chapter of Daniel, when he prayed for the people to come back to Jerusalem, the first few verses of Daniel chapter 9, Jeremiah prays according to God's word, according to Jeremiah's prophecy. Now, according to Jeremiah, you said, Lord, 70 years will be exiled in Babylon, 70 years going to finish now, take us back to Jerusalem. He prayed according to the will of God. That's why when you pray for people to be saved, for salvation of people, we have confidence in heart of prayer. In this time, we'll answer. Because saving people, all people God wants to be saved, is the will of God. 2 Peter 3 9 doesn't want anyone to perish, all to come to repentance. 1 Timothy 2 4. He wants all people to be saved and come to the knowledge of truth. That's the will of God. So when you pray for salvation of people, you don't need God's permission to pray. It's the will of God. So keep on praying, thanking God. One day he will do it. Leave it to him to do it. And then one more thing. This is for husbands only. A hindrance in prayer for husbands. In 1 Peter 3.7, Peter writes to husbands, Christian husbands. Husbands, be considered as you live with your wives and treat them with respect, as weaker partners and as with you of the gracious gift of life so that nothing hinders your prayers. What does it mean? We don't treat our wives properly if we're not considerate to them, compassionate and kind to them. They are actually heirs with us of the gracious gift of life. Many ways they are weak. Physically they are weak maybe. That's why you should be more considerate to them. If you are not considerate to the wives, then our prayers will be hindered. A caution for husbands. Someday I wonder why my prayers are not heard also. That you have, you have, inside you have the conviction that you are not right with your wife. It's important for you to understand that. That we may consider it and, you know, take care of them. So these are hindrances revealed in scripture. So when you pray according to scriptures, we'll have confidence of our prayers being heard. At the right time, God will answer. That's number 10, number 11. Number 12, the last one. There are many other blessings. Don't think we need 12 blessings. There so many blessings, but I'm just, what God put in my heart for this week, I'm sharing. Twelfth blessing is being successful in life, bearing fruit in our lives. The Old Testament, in Joshua chapter 1, verse 8, the Lord tells Joshua, not to be terrified, not to be discouraged, don't let this book of the Lord depart from mouth, meditate upon it day and night, and be careful to do everything that is in it. Then be prosperous and successful. In fact, you're supposed to study God's word, meditate, obey everything in it. Then you'll be prosperous and successful. Today, for us to be successful in life, not in the eyes of the world, in the eyes of God, we live by the word of God. Godly success is different from worldly success. For the world, making a lot of money, becoming very popular, Having a lot of possessions, being very powerful is success. Not in the kingdom of God. In the kingdom of God, doing everything the Lord wants us to do is success. Bearing fruit in every good work is success. The Lord wants us to bear fruit. Whatever way, whatever He's called us to do, in the eyes of God, not eyes of the world necessarily. 
For that, we must be friends of Jesus. In John chapter 15, 15, 16, we read. John 15, 15, 16. The Lord tells his disciples, apostles, I no longer call you servants because servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I call you friends. For everything I have learned from the Father, I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you to go and bear fruit, fruit that will last. Bearing fruit in every good work is success. In the eyes of God, bearing fruit. The Lord asks you 100 things and all 100 things you do, that is success. Don't look at the effect of it. Jeremiah prophesied for 40 years. Nobody listened to him. And he was quite upset sometimes. He complained about wicked people. He complained about accusers. Complained to God about persecutors. Complained to God about God also. But he never flinched from speaking God's word. He didn't flinch. Whatever God told him, he spoke out for 40 years. No one listened to him. But there was success because he spoke. Didn't flinch. He was faithful to what God put in his heart. At the time, at that time, he didn't realize the amazing impact he was to have on the life of the Israelites. On the legacy he would leave behind after he goes away. He never knew that. He lived 589 years before Christ. 587 BC onwards, they were exiled. That's the time he lived. He never realized, imagine the impact he would have on Israel. Many years later, when the Messiah would come to the world, in fact, when they when, before the Messiah came, John the Baptist came. And they thought John the Baptist was the Messiah, maybe the prophet, or Elijah come again. But when Jesus came, when the Messiah came, he asked of his own disciples, who do people say I am? And uh, they say, 16th chapter of Matthew, some say Elijah, some say Jeremiah, one of the prophets. Jeremiah. Who do people say I am? And the Peter says, you are Christ and the living God. But they confuse him to be the man, Jeremiah. Jeremiah has such an impact on the history of Israel. So we don't know the impact we're going to have after we leave, leave this world. So when you go to some difficulty and there's no fruit, apparent fruit in your life, don't feel bad about it. Because you go to heaven, when God says, whatever I told you to do, you did it. Well done, good and faithful servant. Imagine in your office when you're working very hard. And your boss comes and tells you, well done, good job, great job. You feel I'm successful. You know, God, my, my boss is happy with me. And, and he considers it a success. Please, your boss. Imagine God telling us, well done, good and faithful servant. And he will tell that to us when we simply obey his teachings. And as you obey his teachings, also in the world, you'll bear fruit. Be successful in everything that you do. We bear fruit in every good work. To bear fruit, we need to be friends of the Lord and also ask Him for His wisdom, knowing His will through the wisdom He gives us. In Colossians chapter 1, verse 9 onwards, the Apostle Paul writes about this prayer for the Colossian church. He heard about the love for Christ Sorry, love for each other and the faith in Christ. Faith in Christ and love for each other. He had heard about that. And he writes to them and says, the prayer he praying for them. For this reason, since we heard about you, we are not stop praying for you. Asking God to fill you with the knowledge of his will through spiritual wisdom and understanding. And we pray this. They believe lives worthy of God. Pleasing him in every way, bearing fruit in every good work, 
growing in his knowledge and being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might. Where you put in every good work. If you look at King Hezekiah, the Old Testament, King Hezekiah, in 2 Chronicles 31-21, we read, 2 Chronicles 31-21, with the godly king, King Hezekiah. He lived during Isaiah's uh, uh, prophesying, prophesying time. And about him is written, for Hezekiah had done with the eyes of God, and he didn't fail to keep any of God's commandments. Not only did he up on the undertook service of God, he sought his God and worked hard, so he prospered. He sought his God and worked hard, so he prospered. Seeking God basically means seeking the ways of God. God's ways and man's ways are different. God's thoughts and man's thoughts are different. God's ways are revealed in scripture. So when you read the scriptures, obey scriptures, we'll bear fruit in whatever we do. That's what happened to Hezekiah. Sought his God, he worked hard, so he prospered. So he bore fruit. So he was successful. So look at success in a, a godly, from a godly perspective, not from a worldly perspective. And whatever God tells us to do, we do. When the Lord spoke about David being a man after God's own heart, in Acts 13, 22, we read, God testifies about David and then uh, the Apostle Paul recounts that when he gives the testimony in a church, in a place called Iconium, I think, opposite in Antioch, he says, God says about David, I have found David, son of Jesse, a man after my own heart, he will do everything I tell him to do. Everything. That's success. Now, you look at David's life, you begin to wonder. The first thing that comes to mind is, David committed adultery. First thing that comes to mind of people. David means adulterer. Yes, he committed adultery. He repented. Generally repented. Look at his life after he repented. From God's perspective. 1 Kings 15.5 The Lord testifies about David. 1 Kings 15.5 For David had done was right in the eyes of the Lord. Hadn't, kept, hadn't failed to keep any of God's commandments all the days of his life except in the case of Uriah the Hittite. Uriah was the husband of Bathsheba. Got very angry with David. Because he arranged the murder of Uriah, more than having adult, committing adultery in Bathsheba, God displeased about the fact they arranged Uriah's murder. After he repented, he got all the requirements of God. Hadn't failed to give any of God's commandments all the days of his life, except in the case of Uriah the Hittite. So his life was exemplary after he repented. So the point is this, when you put out things behind, what are wrong things you have done, repent and follow the Lord. In our lives will bear fruit simply because obeying God's word means we will bear fruit in whatever we do and God is watching everything that we do. He is our reward. The reward for our success is God himself. In John 12, 26, Jesus says, John 12, 26, Whoever serves me must follow me. Where I am, my servant also will be. My father will honor the one who serves me. Whether we are successful or not, one day we will know when you go to heaven. Here you can have a lot of worldly success. But are we right, right with God? Are we manifesting the peace and joy of the Lord? That depends upon living by the word. So amazing blessings are there of living by the word. And whenever, if you want to be bearing fruit in your life, just say, Lord, I want to be your friend, Lord. Reveal your concerns to me. Empower me with the Holy Spirit. Give me wisdom. Give me your strength. Let me walk in your ways. Let me do whatever you want me to do, Lord. 100% of what you want me to do, Lord, I want to do. To glorify your name and edify your people. That's our desire. There's no reason why God will not 
answer our prayers. Like I said, what do we pray? It should be according to God's will, God's word, and the right motivation. The motivation for our work, whether it be a secular job or a ministry, motivation should be to glorify His name and be a blessing to people, to edify people. If this is our motivation, no reason why God will not give us success. He'll give us strength, he'll give us wisdom. In fact, before the Israelites enter the land of Canaan, the Lord told them how when they enter the land of Canaan, he'll give them success. Condition to obedience. Blessings for obedience, curses for disobedience. In those days, blessings were conditional. And he told them also, when they enter the land of Canaan, when they occupy the land, the book of Deuteronomy, 8th chapter, 17, 18, the Lord told them, you may say to yourself, my power and the strength of my hand has produced this wealth for me. But remember the Lord your God who gives you the ability to produce wealth. Remember the Lord your God who gives you the ability to produce wealth. Don't say I'm a self-made man. God gave you that blessings. He gave you, made you successful. You may say, I've done it. It's not you. It's the Lord. So God wants us to be successful. And when we become successful in whatever we do, we are called to glorify His name and edify people and tell people, when you live for Christ, you live by the word of God, you also can bear fruit in whatever you do. And that's God's will for all His children. To live for Him and then see for themselves how He blesses us in everything that we do. Today's blessings are Amazing because of his grace. In John 1.16, John writes about God. From the fullness of his grace, we will say one blessing after another blessing. From the fullness of his grace. For 12 amazing blessings of living by the word. 